Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 179. If you set your goals ridiculously high and fail, you fail above everyone else's successes. James Cameron. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Audible, and if you guys are like me, I'm constantly learning and reading as many things as I can, and sometimes I can't just sit down for hours and read a book, so I love listening to audiobooks. And Audible gives you one free audiobook that you can download and listen anywhere while you're on the go, while you're doing other work, and it helps you keep that education going, keeps you learning new things, and keeps you moving forward. And I've downloaded filmmaking books, screenwriting books, inspirational books, business books, all sorts of different books that that I listen to all the time. So just head over to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com and download your free filmmaking, screenwriting, or any kind of book you'd like. And today's show is also sponsored by my new course, Editing with DaVinci Resolve. I actually built an entire course on how I edited This Is Meg on DaVinci Resolve. So if you guys want to learn DaVinci Resolve and how to edit on DaVinci Resolve, and take advantage of this free, that's right, free software that Blackmagic gives you, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Resolve Editing. That's IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Resolve Editing. It is on sale for 15 bucks. It's normally 195 bucks, but for you guys, the listeners, the tribe, you get it for 15 bucks. And, of course, it's part of the Indie Film Hustle's Master Circle Membership. So if you're a member, enjoy it. It's already there waiting for you. If not, check out our Master Circle. It's an amazing membership site that I think you guys will get a lot out of. And I'm adding new courses every month. And I'm going to be cranking up new courses coming up in these next few months as well. So just go to IndieFilmHustle.com and hit the Master Circle button at the top. Guys, today is an amazing episode. I'm so excited to bring this episode to you. Today's guest is Oscar-winning and legendary cinematographer Russell Carpenter. Now, if you guys have been under a bridge or under a rock somewhere for the last 30 years, uh, Russell Carpenter is the cinematographer of not only some of the biggest movies of all time, like Marvel's Ant-Man, Triple X, Charlie's Angel, The Negotiator, True Lies, Monster-in-Law, and some of my favorite 80s and 90s action films, Hard Target, which was John Woo's first American movie, The Perfect Weapon and Death Warrant. But the one I'm leaving out is probably his largest and biggest movie ever, actually the second highest grossing film ever, Titanic. Russell by far is one of the sweetest and kindest uh, souls I've ever had the pleasure of talking to. Now, Russell is not only famous for working on Titanic, but also working on just with the, the most amazing directors and filmmakers over the course of his career, none being probably more prolific than uh, the legendary James Cameron. And Russell and I sit down and talk about his almost his entire career, as well as working with James Cameron, how he got the job on True Lies, uh, which is an amazing story, uh, and how he got the job, and then from there how he got to Titanic, and what was it like working on the biggest movie of all time at the time he was making it. I mean, it was a $200 million movie when nothing was even close to a $200 million movie. To have that kind of scope and to deal with what he was dealing with on a daily basis, all the stories, all the rumors of the project going down and and it's going to be a, a complete catastrophe. and It was just a thing that you can't understand in today's world what he went through. On uh, on Titanic and and the just the mere size of it all and how he was able to handle that is a lesson for any cinematographer working not only on big movies obviously but even on smaller indie movies and he just recently did an indie movie and we talk a little bit about his process with that how he works with directors how he sets up his movies I dug in really deep and he was so kind to give us almost ninety minutes to answer all the questions I had for him he was so so generous to do so. So get ready for an epic, epic conversation with Russell Carpenter. 
I'd like to welcome to the show Russell Carpenter, the legendary Russell Carpenter. Thank you so much for being on the show, Russell. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you so, so much. And I'm, I'm so glad I ran into you to, in uh, Cinegear down in L.A. Right. Uh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing what happens when you're here in L.A. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cinegear is, is the place that you'll, you'll constantly be running into anybody you ever met. <laughs> you're right. Absolutely. Everybody in the business kind of walks in there and, and you're, they're walking around like crazy. Um, now, so I wanted to ask you, let's first start off at the very beginning when you were born. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> when, uh, how did you get into the film industry uh, in the first place? What, what made you want to become a cinematographer? Uh, I, at first it was just play, something to do with my friends. I, I, uh, I, I grew up in the Orange uh, County area, the it, it deepest, darkest, very Republican Orange County. This was about two ice ages ago. So yes. we were, but when we were playing, we were we were working with uh, super super eight millimeter cameras, and it was just dumb things to do to keep ourselves occupied. My, my friends and I, and in fact, I, uh, uh, my my sister um, Maureen, who is the sanest of the four of us children. Uh, for raising these ugly animals, uh, okay. she wouldn't say that. Called <laughs> chuck chuck, they're, they're desert lizards, and they and they look like roadkill when they're alive. Oh my god! And, and uh, uh, but they're uh, because I grew up watching things like the original King Kong over and over and over mm-hmm. again because it was on the uh, local station so much. Uh, we decided we would. Uh, Make a monster movie. So we we tied uh, we we took one of her lizards called a chuckwalla. Mm-hmm. And, and incidentally, my my best friend in the world was named Chuck Waller. So mm-hmm. string. That's of hilarious. Course. And uh, so we tied strings to the lizard. I mean, uh, thread to the lizard. Put plastic. Uh, I mean, uh, paper paper wings on the lizard and flew it endlessly back in forth in front of a landscape painting. And that that was our that was our first movie called It Came from the Pet Shop. Oh that's and we worked, genius. Yeah, we, we worked our way up from there. So uh, I was afraid uh, at, at the time I eventually got out of uh, high school dodge track by doing an A V T V audiovisual television mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And um, I, at that time, you know, I didn't have the money to go to, uh, you know, uh, USC or UCLA. And I, I was terrified of those places. They were so big. And, <laughs> right. And, and I my means. And I, I went to, uh, instead went to San Diego State, uh, uh, the state college, San Diego State College at the time became San Diego State University. And I had the supreme luck to get a, a job at a uh, at a public television station very small one uh and uh that's where i really actually got to work with 16 millimeter film and i made every mistake in the world but at least I, you know i learned these mistakes by doing and it really gave me a uh, an opportunity to in, in, instead of just learn about it learn about film in a classroom uh, learn about it by just going out there and doing it. And I stayed in, uh, uh, I did that for a while until I was offered a job mm-hmm. there. I quickly discovered that I can't really, uh, I had a trouble just going every day to the same job and sitting in a, a little desk and I, I, I couldn't do it. So mm-hmm. I, I, I quit. I went to Hawaii for a while. I lived on uh Tuna fish and peanut butter, best best served together. I found out, <laughs> and slept on beaches. And I was I was on a uh, a beach uh, north end of uh, Kauai uh, at Kalalau Valley, and and one morning I, w- I woke up and there were these helicopters descending from the sky, and they were landing on the beach around me. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And these guys got out wearing t-shirts, shorts, and they had these cases and they said Panavision on the side of them. <laughs> you know, this was out in the middle of nowhere. And it turned out that they were there to film uh, the, the, uh, the, gosh, what year was this? Ho- Hawaii, is this not Hawaii Five-0? No, it was not. It was the Jessica Lang. Uh, oh, uh, King Kong. 
of yeah. Ching Fong. Mm-hmm. And uh, I stayed, uh, I, I watched this happen, and it just kind of, it was literally a sign from the heavens that maybe I should get back and get back to California and do something. And I, I uh, uh, got a job at another public television station, and after working there for a couple of years, uh, hooked up with a, uh, a, a director, uh, Tom Everhart, who, who uh, we were both tired of uh, edifying people, and he wanted to make a, uh, uh, a low-budget horror picture. So he convinced this, uh, I, I would guess, call it an office furniture uh, czar <laughs> in, uh, okay. in to, to fund our little movie if uh, this fellow's wife could be like the most prominent zombie in the movie. Obviously. Obviously, and uh, uh, it, we we had to have a a, a plane crash uh, or the remnants of a plane crash uh, in the uh, uh, in the movie. So we we almost burned down uh, somebody's backyard, creating that, and uh, and and then uh, miraculously, this, this little movie was uh, was released. Not you know not like for for like four days or something like sure, that. Sure, sure. That gave me false hope, and I, I, I moved not far, but moved north to, to L.A. And uh, I, that's uh, where the, I would call it the, the starvation started. But uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I think my false hope was just that, false hope. And, uh, and I, I, I was afraid, uh, the, my problem was I was just afraid to make phone calls, just, uh, just right. to call people. Mm-hmm. And, and I realized that lots of other people had had well at that time we had 16 millimeter demo reels that we had to you know show to to show to people and we would just you know put them in their hands and then we would wait the two to three weeks it would take them to, to actually look at the reel right and uh, uh, it, it was a, it was a good experience for me I I, uh, I just uh, uh, learned that not not to be so afraid, I was still mortified, uh-huh. terrified. <laughs> eventually, what happened was that friends of mine that I've been working with in documentaries and kind of they moved up to uh, to LA and they were starting to do things and they would get me in on on interviews for things. And from there, it was really, uh, 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 you know, well, uh, I w- I would call it it was like a lightning fast, mm-hmm. uh, fifteen years <laughs> <laughs> overnight success. Yeah, uh, uh, overnight success. Fifteen years of, you know, just waiting and waiting and waiting for the, the for the very next thing to, to to come in. But in the meantime, what I was doing was I was, I uh, at that time again it was like VHS tapes or beta tapes that I would watch the work of uh, uh, cinematographers that I really admired, and I'd watch these things backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and 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 learn learn from that 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 was kind of the, how i learned plus the little time i would have on the on the set and i was starting to do the dramatic form stuff if you could call it that because it wasn't really dramatic it mm. was kind, kind of schlock right let's <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, just, just call it like it was but sure uh, but it got me on a set and that was the best experience i I I could have, and I just moved from zero budget to no budget to you know you, slightly you know budget movies, and I, and and it was much harder to get into the union. So I just I just kept doing this as I worked my way along. So you and, so yeah, basically well, you were just grinding it for fifteen or twenty years until you started really getting some momentum built up for yourself. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, to to people who are who are in the, in the same uh, position, I, I just said, if there was one thing be, besides learning as I went and really going to as many seminars as I could and and all that, it, for me, it, it it became just a matter of persistence, and uh, it, it in one way it was miserable, but in a waiting. But in the other way, I, I didn't have anything else I knew how to do. So I, I kind of had to stick with this, you know, even when it just seemed like grimmer than grim. And so 
So I, I uh, but eventually I got to a point where I said, I think I can make a, a, a living at least doing the, the, the independent films. Mm-hmm. And, and the other thing that happened was that sometimes things would happen that were like sheer, seemed like sheer disaster, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they actually led to something where, uh, to a break. Like for, uh, for instance, I, I did, uh, four episodes of the wonder years before I was fired. And <laughs> okay. Why were you yeah. fired? Well, I, a couple reasons. One, I would walk, you know, with that, I would walk into somebody's office. So they, they say, Oh, Russell, you know, I want, I want to talk to you about one thing. I said, you know, the, the dailies, you know, the, 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 the film, it, it's, it's just too bright. You've got to darken it down. This, we don't want this to play as purely broad comedy. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I, you know, I'm thinking, well, I, that's not the way I lit it. I don't know quite know what they're talking about. And, and then literally, like 10 minutes later, somebody said, hey, Russell, I want to talk to you about something. <laughs> they take me into the room, their room, and, and look, I look at their TV set, and they say, this, this, is, this is the wonder years. It, it, it's supposed to be brighter. You're lighting it too dark. And I mean, literally. <laughs> oh my and God! And I'm just thinking, oh, I don't think I'm long for this this job. And also at that time, uh, and I didn't really understand it. The mm-hmm. the, the, the people who ran the shows called showrunners. They they really wanted the DP to kind of tell the director what what to do because the directors would come in and they were at that time TV kind of like. Yeah. TV traffic cops and the person who really ran the show was the showrunner and 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 I was coming from the space of the director's the boss right I I want whoever he, he or she is I'm serving that person and that and that did that really kind of for that show made me the wrong for a person for the job so I got uh, I got fired from that I didn't know what to do I was uh, uh, you know, I, I I was doing in between. I was doing like these odd job things for. Uh, they had this thing called man, like it was a temporary uh, employment agency called Manpower. You know, so we okay. would go and do that, and that was, and and I would do jobs like one of the worst jobs I ever had, but it was enlightening. Was was I, I worked? I lasted half a day. I I worked at this place that was like this mom and pop. Uh, uh, vegetable, uh, liquid vegetable vitamins for your plants. Okay. I sat with about 20 other people in a room and we, by hand, we put labels on these. Oh my God, jeez. And there was a guy who would walk around and tell us, no, no, it's down a little to the right, you know, or speed it up or whatever. And it was the most mindless thing you Mm -hmm. ever did. And I asked the guy next to me, I said, how long have you been here? And he said, well, five years. Oh, my God. And, and, uh, <laughs> and that was an epiphany. And it, the epiphany was, wow, you know, there are probably millions of people in the world who have jobs like this. You know, and, and, and however miserable it seems at times, I, I, at least I have a, a job that at least when I'm doing it, I really love it. You know, mm-hmm. and it, and uh, it, it just made me, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, it didn't really get me over anything except at least have an appreciation for the, <laughs> for the for job. The, for the job. And, but, uh, but what happened was I did, like after that show, I re- had, was really running out of money. I took a, a show I was trying to get out of doing, I was doing a lot of, uh, I know this C or Z level horror movies. Mm-hmm. It this uh, something I really didn't want to do. Uh, mm-hmm. It was Pet Cemetery Two, and it was. But I had the greatest time. And the people were great. The director was great. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the people who was in that was Eddie Furlong, and he had just he had just uh, not too long ago done Terminator Two, mm-hmm. and and yeah, he was very young. And so, but and the the people who were kind of 
his on-set guardian and said, oh, you know, you, you know there's something about you. You get along really well with uh, Jim Cameron. So, and, you, so before we get to Jim, because I have a bunch of questions about, <laughs> about, about Titanic and your relationship with Jim, I want to take you back a little bit to um, one of your first films. And I'm just dying to hear what experience it was like and what lessons you learned from shooting Critters 2, the main course. Uh, well, let's see. What did I learn? Uh, because, I mean, that's the thing. A lot of people only see the Oscar. They only see, not from you, but generally, when they see someone successful in the business, they only see the end result of 20, 30 years of grind. Uh, yeah, and I, 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 that's what I have to say is that for all of that, I mean, there, I, there, there are a few cinematographers in the business who, who seem to, you know, like, rise out out of the depths of the ocean <laughs> full blown uh, I mean full blown cinematographers right uh, you know Janusz Kaminski or uh, or, or Chivo uh, oh Chivo yeah Chivo of course yeah. yeah or Vilmos or one of these guys or, or Vilmos and you go oh my god they're fully formed you know and they're they're like 14 years old <laughs> and they're, they're shooting you know these, <laughs> these master pieces and I'm and why am I still on the bunny slopes of life, you know, just, you know, grinding it out, you know, just scooting along? I don't know how the world works, but I, I, I do know that if you keep putting out the energy, mm -hmm. uh, eventually, I, I mean, it, thing, things, things happen. And I, I, uh, I had a great time with, with, with Critters too, and I... And, and you're just trying to, you know, even though, e even though you're looking at the, your heroes, and, and at that time I was looking at people like Vittorio Storaro, and yeah. I said, and I'm shooting critters too, and yet maybe there's <laughs> something from from my hero that I can apply to this mm -hmm. and add it or, or try to make the the light a little more interesting, and. Uh, uh, you know, so each, each 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 thing you do is somehow putting a uh, a part of your personal camera together because we all talk about the gear and stuff like that, but the real the real gear is the the real camera is the camera inside the one that you're putting together that that you'll be putting together for your whole life is mm. that and. And anytime you get on a set on anything, it's a just it's just the most excellent opportunity to to not only develop the vision, but to learn how to develop the vision while things are falling apart. Because in a way, on film sets, they always are. Always. I mean, because there's usually never enough time. Uh, there's usually, I wouldn't call it the daily emergency, but but. A lot of things just don't happen the the way you imagine they might, especially when you're starting out, because the people that you're working with are uh, have usually have about the same experience level uh, that that one would as a young cinematographer. So uh, I, I would just take these these little things that that I I could do, and maybe it, it certainly wasn't every shot, but but. I would say, okay, at the end of the day, I could say, oh, but I did some terrific stuff with that shot or that shot or that shot. And, and uh, so it, it, was, it was never a situation where, oh, um, I felt that I'm a good, good enough to wait for a script. That was not the, I, <laughs> that ideal never happened. It was, mm -hmm. I've got to eat, <laughs> you know, right, got to right. start myself, got to pay the mortgage. Mm -hmm. What can I do to get experience? And, and I think that that was one of the best uh, uh, a, a person that I know who, who, who worked in a lab. He said, you, you just said, said, do everything you can do, you know, just, just do every everything you can do. And that turned out the, uh, the way that that worked for me. And, you know, and I have and I have talked to cinematographers and say, no, I, I, I will wait until I, I have a script that I think is worthy. Mm -hmm. uh, of being of shooting, and that worked. That worked for them. But I, the 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 
I just I picked a path that I needed to pick out of necessity, basically. Now you so and during that time, during the time you were doing a lot of horror movies like Nightmare Before Nightmare on Elm Street and the legendary Puppet Master, which was one of my favorite. I loved oh, yeah. that. Must have been such fun shooting Puppet Master. Well, I that I only did. Uh, I, I did uh, uh, like pick additional, up shots, sure, additional stuff. Additional photography. At that time, I would do anything that I could uh, work it on Nightmare on Elm Street. That, I mean, those those films were actually a lot of fun to do. They were really a lot of fun. And they were done in basically warehouses out in the Santa Clarita Valley, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of, they say, way off the grid. And they were at, uh, gosh, I forget what years these were. This must have been the 80s or... Uh, that was 89, yeah. Yeah, 89. It was, again, it was much, much harder uh, the, well, the, let's just say the union has, has really changed uh, a lot. Now, I, now I see the union as 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 much more realistic in terms of uh, their their educational programs, and it, it, it's not like it's it's not kind of like life and death just to get into the union. Mm-hmm. But at that time, it was it was it w- was tougher. So those of us who needed a, a a, a place to paint to do something mm-hmm. we, we were uh, we were, that was what we worked on things like the uh, new line the company mm-hmm. that did Nightmare on Elm Street was mm-hmm. a relatively new uh, company and this this was a place that we could work and then we also uh, you know and I also met other other cinematographers and filmmakers who I've, I've known forever my I, uh, uh, my gaffer uh, Len Levine we we met in the, in the eighties and and uh, we've been working uh, on and off together ever since. So mm-hmm. that, that's a long that's a long relationship. Now, and then you also during that time you started getting some more action work uh, and did, and you actually worked on some of my favorite action movies of the uh, late eighties and early nineties, like the the classic Death Warrant by John Claude Van Damme, uh, per, yeah. perfect oh, yeah. perfect oh. weapon, hard target. Yeah, when, when I when I look back on the Carpenter opus, I'm sure uh, uh, <laughs> that's where it will be right right up there because you you never had uh, uh, more than three word uh, sentences for the star to, to to say. You know, it was it was but it, it was it, yeah. It was action. It was, it was action. Yeah, and, oh. and plenty of it, and uh, uh, about as mindless as they come. But you know, again, uh, I. You're working, had, and and that was the thing. One this one thing leading to another. Uh, the director of Death Warrant. Uh, 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 I just blanked on Darren's rig. Mm-hmm. His father. His father was going to do this film, uh, a, a Japanese sci-fi movie that had at the time a phenomenal budget. I think uh, it was 55, uh, 55 million bucks. I have. I, I'm looking at it right now. It's a monster budget for its day. I, it was solar crisis, yeah. right? It was that called solar crisis, and it, and it turned out to be an unwatchable movie. But <laughs> I did good work on that film. I was really happy with what I did, and so I went back and I co- collected bits and pieces. I got this and that, and then I went in and I basically retimed the the thing myself mm-hmm. uh, to use as my showreel. So I, here I have my whatever it is. Okay, let's say fifty five million dollar showreel mm-hmm. to show. And I didn't know what to do with it, but so I had that. I had something to show. And as you go along, you just have to because because as a cinematographer, you can be the potential cinematographer that you want to be, but you have to show people that you're in fact validly a a real cinematographer. So that's why it's even even if something that you do is the acting's bad or, or this mm-hmm. or that story's bad. Somehow you you can cobble it together uh, skillfully, either yourself or with the help of an editor, mm-hmm. and you use that to show people. But showing people something that you've done is, that's absolutely paramount that you, you, you have that. So, yeah, that no. I would, yeah. Now, as far as um, – there was one movie in that time period in the early 90s, uh, Hard Target, which was oh. a big deal back in the day because it was John Woo's first yeah. American film. 
What was yeah. it like working with John and, and how did that, that change? Because I know he was used to, li- I mean, I think Hard Boiled and The Killer, they shot in like 250 days or something. Like he just sat and just shot. You didn't have that on Hard Target. How was that, that relationship to work with on that, on that movie? That, it was amazing. But one, uh, John is, is one of the nicest people you could ever meet. And I, you know, I said, how is it that this guy is making you know, He's shooting the most violent movies ever that are, are, are just mere, are they're, they're clever. They're very, uh, but you know, there's a lot of blood flying around <laughs> and doves and, and doves. And and doves, doves, and, doves, and, doves, doves. And, oh, doves! Yeah, <laughs> doves. Of course, we we even yeah we, we had our obligatory dove. I think. <laughs> yes, you it, did. <laughs> yeah, and it uh, it it was. I know it was hard on John, in the sense that in a in America, he said, and he he said this to me. After the film, he says, one thing I've learned is that in America, celebrity is everything. So he says celebrities. And, and at that time, you know, uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme oh, was, he was, was huge. He was huge. Huge. And he said, and, and therefore they have a they have a lot more input, not only into how things are shot sometimes, but especially how things are cut afterwards. And and he said he said that that was <laughs> Probably one of the reasons he, he he eventually went back and did some of these really great films back in, in China was that he was not used to dealing with uh, the political culture in mm. uh, in Hollywood, and he was not used to. I mean, really being the the god on the. The set, not that I, I'm not saying that in an egotistical no, way. No, no, I'm saying it in the sense that vision. The, the, it's the vision, yeah. director vision. And he he said uh, uh, if he wanted to do a big action scene with um, you know amazing action, he he literally have hundreds of people who would want to do this crazy ass stuff. That that would be very hard to pull off in the United States, mm. like, like given the regulations that they they have here. <laughs> sure. But the uh, but the the experience of working with him was great. But also learning the the way that he shot was very different in terms of how action is, is staged in the United States. In the United States, you'll take your action and you'll take your moments and you'll shoot in pieces. Uh, this piece. And, and, and here, and then we move this piece, and it doesn't necessarily have to be shot in order. John would arrange his shots, his action, as, as though it was a kind of a putting all the springs into a, a, a fine Swiss watch. And every little piece of action would lead to another piece and flow into it. And, it, and so he, instead of doing all these little pieces, he would do, he would make it more of a ballet and, mm-hmm. and make sense as a whole. But in order to do that, and this is where it, it, it falls on the cinematographer who's working with, with John, is that he'll want to do it with seven or eight cameras. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, and how you get the, how, one, how you light for that and... And then one, how you how, how it's almost impossible to keep the other camera out of the shot, but somehow you do it. And so we would do these takes, and we do them once or twice, and 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 he would have it. It might it might take us the you know several hours to set these things up, but once it happened, you just go, oh my god, this shot took us to this camera, and 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 he he then he knows. That, okay, he's going to use two thirds of a second of this shot, which is going to take us to the other angle, and that may last three seconds, which will take us to the other angle. You know, it, it was really wow. amazing. So then, basically, yeah. instead of instead of doing seven or eight different setups, you would work really hard to get everything in one setup, but you basically have done your sh- done the scene or done that that, that sequence. Yeah, and it's a it. it, it, it 
also it's harder on the, the stunt people and the actor because you have to make it look like every hit connected. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, but uh, it, these things had an energy though when they were cut together that was really great. Yeah. So I, I learned not not only a lot about how to shoot for multiple cameras, but I also learned uh, something about you know staging. And Editing and, and, and flow. Yeah, I mean, even Hard Target, if you, I mean, you watch Hard Boiled or you watch The Killer and then you watch Hard Target, you can tell he's handcuffed a bit. But yes, yes, yes. But, but you can see the woo come out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, yes, and some of the signature things that, that he liked to do, we certainly, we certainly did those. But, uh, but, but then you can also tell, I mean... So here, this is a John claude Van Damme film, and yes. it, but it is, and then you go back and you look at Hard Boy, and they, they have a lot, I mean, there's a lot more going on in those films. Oh, than, than God. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing. Mm -hmm. so, they're, master, they're masterpieces of action, I mean. They, they, yeah, they're, yeah, and you, you go back and you, you look at the, the bird cage scene. And oh, got, the opening of Hard Boy, oh my God. So yeah, amazing. I could just go. Oh my God, where, what planet did this come from? I mean, it's they're they're really amazing films. So uh, yeah, and so, so so that was a great experience. So so you were starting to talk about how uh, you and Mr. Cameron got together. You were saying that you met uh, you worked with Eddie for a long after Terminator Two, and his people said, "Hey, you would work well with Jim." <laughs> yeah, and at the time he was. Uh, Jim wanted to do a. He wanted to do an independent film. He wanted to yes. do a drama. And yeah, it, that drama that he wanted to do, a thriller or something like that. He wanted to do. I heard about that. It was the Crowded Room. This 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 is a famous film that's never been made about the life of a of, of a person who had like fifteen or sixteen personalities, mm -hmm. and it's been around Hollywood for uh, I I don't know eons, and it's, somehow it's never gotten. Got made, but he wanted to do that, and uh, so Eddie's people and also some other people who knew me, I guess, suggested to, to Jim that he should uh, uh, meet me. I got uh, we there was a party at the end of uh, at the end of uh, Pet Cemetery too, and I think he came to that. And we talked for a little while, and I, you know, I, I was. Uh, I, I probably had the life force at the time, uh, uh, like a, of a of a piece of wood or something, because of the first time. Right. And, uh, you know, just uh, and then uh, uh, it was weird because because after that I was I was in Louisiana, in New Orleans, with John Woo, do uh, because that film well that film fell apart. Right. Uh, I but what I did do was I did show my fifty five million dollar sample reel. <laughs> and, right, amazing yeah. reel, amazing sample reel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he liked it, and uh, uh, but the film fell apart. So I thought, well, that's okay. So, so uh, I didn't, you know, I just go back to uh, while doing the John Woo film, mm -hmm. and, and it, it's really weird. I got this phone call from his producer while I was there, uh, and said, she said. Uh, when you get back to town, uh, I want you to have lunch with uh, Jim Cameron. He he has his project. He he'd like to talk to you about. So uh, and and this is before the internet. So right. uh, my my crew and I start to to get every copy of Variety that we can possibly get. And I'm looking <laughs> through these varieties, trying to see what what he has, because in my mind, I'm thinking he's got a little documentary or he's got a something something little project that he needs a right. cinematography. This is and this is the convers this is the, that's the phone call that at that point in, in 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 Hollywood history and to this point as well you get that call it's like hey Jim Cameron wants to meet you about a project I'm assuming that's a really big deal. Well, it was a big deal, but I couldn't put my I, I couldn't put my I, I couldn't put the, the the Russell I knew up to that point mm -hmm. in the same room of uh, oh and it's a it's a big feature. Right. So I'm looking through these things, and all I can see is, oh, he's doing something with Arnold Schwarzenegger called True Lies. And I go right past that, because that, <laughs> of course, that's not what we're talking about here. Okay? Right. That couldn't be. Right. But, you couldn't even uh, believe that you would be even up for that situation. 
Yeah, but when I got back, uh, exactly. And then when I got back and called, called his producer up, and, and the lunch was set up, and it, it, again, it was surreal. We, went, we were in, near his house in, uh, in Malibu, and we are sitting down at Tony's Taverna. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess that's what it was called. Yeah. And he starts talking about this film, and it's, it's, it's this Arnold Schwarzenegger thing. I can't, you know, my, my head is kind of exploding. I, I can't <laughs> believe he's talking about this film. Right. And, and this, is, this is how Jim hires somebody. So we're, we're, you know, so he, he's starting to talk about the film and he's talking about this and, his, and and like halfway through the conversation, he says, he starts using the word we. And he says, and then when we get to Washington, there are these kind of problems, you know, and, and then after that, you got to go there and we've got to be ready to do that. And I'm, and I'm sitting there, you know, like a dog, you know, I can't even hear, I can't even understand. I'm looking at him, but I can't understand. <laughs> Surreal, completely surreal. It was totally surreal, and so we have lunch, and I, I leave, and I and I, I call my agent, and I say because by that time I had an agent, I said I think I was just hired to do this big picture, mm -hmm. and she calls me back two days later, and she says, "Yeah, you knucklehead, you know, <laughs> yes, you were hired to do the film," and uh, and then it the. That, I guess, of course, that opened the Jim Cameron uh, uh, chat life. And it, it was very interesting because uh, uh, the, the pre-production went really, really well. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, and I just felt like, uh, you know, of course, I felt like I had a lot to prove and, and you know, stuff like that. And, and, then, uh, and then we started filming and... Uh, and that, that went really well, too. It was going, going oh, my God. And uh, just never let this happen to yourself, because this is what, what I did. I said, well, I don't know what, because I, I had heard stories about other cinematographers mm -hmm. that had worked with him, and they, they weren't good stories. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I, maybe, maybe I'm the person who cracked the code, you know? Oh, <laughs> and, no. Oh, <laughs> no. Everything is just going so well. And uh, so all those legendary James Cameron stories, for you at least on True Lies, didn't happen. Uh, they didn't happen up until about uh, the fourth weekend. <laughs> and, 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 and this story I, I tell a lot because it's, it's, it, I, it has something to do with persistence, I guess. And, mm -hmm. and also something to do with the fact that, that, Sometimes you've got to develop a skin, a tough enough skin that you you know that you, you realize that it's not about you. When you, because I went out on plenty of interviews, was turned down plenty of times, and you know you're you're kind of in the same boat that an actor is. You, mm -hmm. Well, and you're going to meet with a lot of rejection, and you just cannot take that person. Just mm -hmm. go back, and just keep doing your thing, and, and hoping the the next thing comes along, and it, eventually it will. Maybe not as fast as you wanted it, but there it is. Mm -hmm. But so uh, we we were. He had been watching everything on the uh, on the uh, what well, that time on the camera video. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. And so now we're in a uh, we have a screening one night. It's the first time we're in a theater at, at the gym's uh, uh, screening room. Uh, there are about forty people in there. They're all department heads, and we're do, we're. Uh, the film starts to roll and we're watching a scene and it's a scene where uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger has, has just returned from his first mission that he was up in the snow mm -hmm. and he, he returns home and he goes over into the room where Jamie Lee Curtis is uh, sleeping, goes over, looks at himself in a mirror as he takes off uh, mm -hmm. his wedding or, you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so that shot comes on. And it, it's it's a little dark, and I, I think, oh, I'm going to have to have them do a reprint on this, print it up a few points. And all of a sudden, I look over at Jim, who's who's sitting beside me, and he's just sitting there shaking his head. I go, <laughs> Jim, Jim, what's wrong? And, and now he says loud enough so he's sure everybody in the room can oh, hear. Oh no! He says, he says, I have the highest paid actor in this or any parallel universe 
And I can't see his eyes. I said, Jim, Jim, well, I'll just print it up three points. I think everything's okay. He says, no, you, you print this scene up three points and you've ruined the mood of the scene. And that loud enough for everybody to hear. Oh. So I, you know, from then on, I just want to die because <laughs> Because he'd wait, a, he'd wait a couple more minutes, and then he'd say something about, you know, a shot had come up that was maybe a little overexposed. Mm -hmm. And you'd say, where on earth did you learn to read a light meter? Oh. You know, yeah, louder, you know. Oh. And, and so at there, there, I, I endured like three more comments like this. And literally, before, you know, they turned on the lights. And, you know, but before the light was all the way up, I think I was out of that room. I just ran out, you know, and I, I was out. At, I went out to the parking lot and I called my wife and I said, well, I, you know, I had my run with Jim Cameron. I, I'm sure this was my last day. I, I just, <laughs> aliens were horrible, blah, blah, blah. And I look up and there's the first assistant director and the, um, and then one of the producers and they're just smiling at me. <laughs> they're laughing at me. All right. And I go, what, what? And, and they just say, you know, he does that to everyone. And I said, no. And he said, no, they said, just call, you know, they, they said, we gave me a name of a couple of the other Sydney cars. I said, just call them and, you know, talk to them about this. Mm -hmm. I did, I talked to uh, um, uh, Mikhail Solomon who had done The Abyss. And, and he said, well, did he use the, the line about, uh, you know, where on earth did you learn to, yeah. uh, you, and did he, did he say uh, you, his grandmother could shoot better than this or, uh -huh. you, you know, and I said, yeah. And, and that, <laughs> I said, okay, I know I really have to have this credit and uh, I'm going to stick it out. And, uh, there were days that would go fine, and there were days that just felt like somebody hooked me up to two high voltage wires, and I was being electrocuted for the entire day, you know, until they called rap. And uh, that was my that that was that, true lies. That was true lies, and that 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 was if there was ever a trial by fire picture, that was that was it. For sure. I mean, you hear. I mean, I. I mean, I, I studied Jim's career fairly closely in The Abyss. I mean, one of the one of the craziest experiences of all time. And you hear all these stories about him. And I, and you know, I, I actually knew some people who worked on uh, Avatar and how he's changed over time, but yet still very, very Jim. Uh, <laughs> but so I wanted to ask you about working yeah, with. with uh, yeah. Work yeah, he has changed over time. I've heard he's. I've heard, and this is just again from second hand. I've heard he softened a bit. He's not as like he would be back in the prior before Titanic stage, but he's still Jim. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing. The thing about well, one the thing about Jim, if, if one ever gets an opportunity to work with him, or, or maybe somebody like him who's coming along, is that there's a a singularity of vision and, and almost a laser-like concentration on the scene that he's doing. I mean, I've never seen anybody concentrate like him. And I've never seen anybody working harder than he does on the set. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, how can somebody be that invested second after second, you know, because the rest, the, the rest of us mortals seem to say, Okay, I just did that. Now I've got a chance to take a breath. Maybe I'll just go over to the craft service table and do this. Mm -hmm. I, that doesn't seem to be Jim to me. He he is. I mean, there's in terms of pure devotion to what he's doing. I've never seen another person like him. You know, in, in my experience, and and that's that's really something. And he and, and my sense about him is that. Every time he does a project, he goes out and says, there's something I don't know how to do. There's something I've never done. You know, mm -hmm. so with True Lies, it's, well, I've never really shot, you know, a comedy, you know, uh, so I'm going to do a comedy or, uh, uh, you know, or, or now here's Titanic and I'm going to make, I need to make a film that not only succeeds as an action film, but I've got to make a film that totally succeeds as a love story. 
or the action's not going to mean very much. Right. And uh, so he, he, he's, he said, he says, well, I don't know how to do this film now. I'm finished. You know, right. he, that, that's his attitude. And, and, uh, and you know, he, I don't think he expects everybody to be perfect, but I ex think, I know he expects everybody to be doing the absolute best job they can, that they know how to do. Now, and, when... And, and, and that's, that's saying a lot. And I, I mean, I, I think for the, the storms that come up, when they do come up, if you learn not to take them personally and know this is, this is, this is going to last another minute and then it's back to work, then, <laughs> then, then you have a chance of not having a nervous breakdown. You know? and, some so. people, and some people just can't handle that. Some people take it too personally. And in this business, I think, is one thing I've learned over the years is you can't take it personally. A lot of times you just can't. you got to move on. No, you can't take it personally. And then on the other hand, especially as a director of photography, you need to – so if there's angst on the set – you also need to develop the skills that you're not the main source of that angst. And, or you're doing something to, you know, okay, we all know that things have to be done. They have to try to do them in a certain time. But you, uh, I, I think I would, really starting out, uh, I would mistake my passion when I say, oh, this is just passion. But, you know, in some ways, I was, I, I'd look back at it and I'd say, no, that wasn't passion. You were just being an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. <laughs> yeah. And you can, you can learn to have that passion. And this took a long time to learn. You can learn to have that passion and, and, and also have a roaring good time because you're doing one of the best. You, you know, you're in the position of having one of the best jobs, at least I think, that anybody can have. Now, when when working with a director that's so hands on, like, what advice would you give? Um, what advice would you give to a cinematographer who has a very hands on director, meaning that he's very involved with the visual look of the film and how it's shooting? He might even tell you a little bit of like, I want this here, because because a lot of times you you know with Jim and I talked to uh, Mr. Cameron, um, he's obviously a very technical director and he really knows a lot about what you're doing and pretty much about what everybody else is doing on the yeah, set. And, and, and as, as is probably often quoted, he'll, he'll, he'll tell people that, that he knows that. <laughs> and, then, and, and the whole miserable aspect of that is that he's probably right. You know? <laughs> right. When you're working with a genius, it's, it's you're you like, know, you know, and I, and I, I would put Jim in that category of being a genius. I do. I think he, I think because you, at one point you go, well, how can, somebody who's so technical do a movie that's also has so much imagination and, and, and the way he paints and how he, how with his camera angles and the stru the structure of his script, he sets up a, a totally immersive mm -hmm. experience, you know, and that is that, that, to have that technical side and that, that, uh, that artistic side all firing you know on uh, on all all cylinders you know they're they're all working you know, all the uh you know that doesn't happen with jim you 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 know and, and i i guess in, in in my personality uh makeup i i i'm a pleaser and i do i am that person who says this is the director's vision how can mm -hmm. i help this director with his or her vision mm -hmm. of what she wants uh, and so you go in, so there's Jim on one end of the spectrum who, who is just happy to set up and, and frame every, every camera, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and, uh, you know, on like a Titanic, uh, uh, it, it's interesting, like as a cinematographer, I had, I, ha I had the freedom to do things the way that I thought they should be done but if i wasn't doing what he wanted he would definitely let me know so right he would say no no i want that's not it i want this i, I or, or or i think the light here should be harder or something like that or so he literally would get that detailed like no I, this needs to be it's like almost like a kubrick in that sense that has such a complete control of the vision 
that if he doesn't see you doing what he wants, he will push you or nudge you in the proper direction well, according to yeah. his vision. But I, I also tell uh, directors that I know don't have those chops. You know, mm -hmm. they're wonderful people who have come from writing or some mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. aspect. They say, and especially now, it's much, much easier with uh, digital. Yeah. You know, like, that, look, if you see something that, that, that for some reason doesn't work for you, just just tell me. And, I, I, and uh, you know, and, unless it's something really, I really don't agree with that. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm a, I just said, okay, well, yes, I can uh, do this a little different and let, let's see if you're, and, I, and in a, you know, and in a second I'll come back and say, yes, that, that's right. That it's, it's, it's not so much technical. It's just something it's you, it's story driven mm -hmm. for most people. So as a cinematographer, you go, okay, on films, there are lots of things that are the same. But I've always found every single film to be different, and a lot of that has to do with how you work with a with a director. I did a, a lovely film in India called Parch, you know, very mm -hmm. low, and the director was fantastic. But we we never really, after she told me what she, where she felt the heart of the story was, or mm -hmm. or or this particular scene, uh, we didn't really talk about. Uh, lighting, we uh, and she and in this situation, I was I would suggest blocking. I would say, okay, given what I just saw, we could do it this way, this way, and this way. And because we were on a budget, and if we do it, we'll do it this way. We tell the story, and it, we just shave a couple of shots off the scene uh, uh, because we're doing it more efficiently. So, so as a cinematographer, you can be a service in. in to any kind of director that you're you're working with, but again, with, uh, if, it, if if it's a Jim Cameron, you know that they're going to have uh, lots of input about things that other directors may not care a bit about. It's very very flexible business that way. So let's talk a little bit about that little film Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> that is, you know, we've heard legendary stories about, you know, stories from the set. I knew a few actors on the on the set that have told me a lot of stories. I mean, at the time, it was the biggest budget film in Amer in, in filmmaking history, in Hollywood history. I mean, you basically had every toy you ever wanted as a cinematographer uh, on set, I'm imagining. Can you... Can you tell me what it was like working on a film of that size and also that magnitude? I mean, because everybody in the world was looking at that movie and looking how it would finish and how it would end. Yeah. Uh, for, for a lot of the, uh, what we'll, 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 we'll say, our, your younger listeners who weren't really, or certainly weren't reading at that time, uh, the film was such a phenomenon when it was being made. Oh, God. That there was actually on the front of Variety, I think, there, uh, there, was, a, there was an outline box with, uh, called Titanic Watch because <laughs> everybody thought this thing was going to be uh, just a, a just ghastly flop because it was the most expensive movie at the time. And there, there were, uh, occasionally there would be setbacks because uh, things were being tried that had never been tried before, right? It, and also, it was it was what I, I call uh, a, a very special movie in that it was a hybrid movie in the sense that a lot of it, its heart and soul was with the uh, the David Lean epics, you know, Ryan's mm -hmm. Doctor or uh, Doctor Zhivago, or mm -hmm. you know, the the the. Uh, the those big films that it had had a beating heart like that, and yet it was it was it was using technically it was using some very very old techniques, and at the same time, it had uh, the other foot was distinctly in the future in mm -hmm. terms of being done with computer, mm -hmm. uh, totally cutting edge at that time. You know when, when the when the the, the, the film was in pre-production. They, they hadn't really worked out a really viable way to make realistic uh, ocean water. And, uh, 
Uh, I mean, he said they, he, uh, so the, 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 there were two, two things that I would read in the paper, uh, and, you know, because now it, was good. it wasn't just the trades, it was the LA Times. Well, one was that things were unsafe on the, the set, mm-hmm. uh, and that is not true. Mm-hmm. That, uh, it was, we, we had uh, so, sometimes uh, safety meetings that would last up to an hour because we had an international crew, so you had to, you had to do all the safety notes in, in English and then in Spanish because we were in Mexico. And then uh, we had a lot of Hungarian stunt people. Uh, so, so, but but safety was was really really at the top of everybody's uh, agenda and, and gyms too. It was definitely not a well you know people are expendable kind of thing. So whatever somebody cracks a rib breaks a leg you mm-hmm. know, so that that wasn't it. I didn't. And the other thing was well they're just they're just down there every day figuring out how to throw gold bullion into the the, the water, this thing is so expensive, you know, mm-hmm, to, mm-hmm. To, and that wasn't the case either. You know, people would come down and, from the studios and, and try and figure out how to make things be less expensive. And, that, and they weren't coming up with even solutions either. In fact, in fact, the, the, the thing was the film was so big, it was hard for anybody to get a, get a handle on it. And when I came down, the first time I went down there, it was before to Rosarito Beach. The studio hadn't really been built. It was a work in progress, and there was an excitement about it. It was, it was like, well, this is how the gold rush must have been. You know, right. buildings coming up like, you know, crazy in days. I would go, uh, I was actually working on another uh, movie at the time this was happening, so I'd come down on the weekends, and, and it's like I, every weekend, Gosh, there, there's another big building just came up, and there's a, there's a, the tanks are being built, and it was really quite a sense of excitement about it. And then, uh, but what happened was, you know, uh, on a on a regular film, you you have a sense of where everything fits in, and, and here are the pieces, and you you can look at the film as a totality. It, it, this film was just so big. You just had to look at it. I did last week, and it, it was you constantly putting out one fire after another. Oh, this says it. This said it isn't ready. You know, it's like, but and I'll just, just for example, my uh, John Buckley, who was my gaffer on that that picture, he, he went out as a ship was being built, and he was trying to figure out one how to table something. <laughs> As the Titanic. Because <laughs> basically the whole thing is a, a, just a huge piece of scaffolding. I mean, a, a huge piece of scaffolding. On, on water. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> but, but, yeah, but not much of the ship was ever in, in water. I mean, that's part of the illusion that the, the, the tank, uh, parts, most of the tank was just three feet deep. Just, just deep enough so a lifeboat could be in the water. And, and you'd have like three inches of, of clearance at the bottom of the water. Uh, you know, it's kind of like being at Disneyland that way. And, and right. so it was easy to move the lifeboats around. And then much closer to the, uh, the ship, uh, the, the, then the tank was dug much deeper so people could jump off the side of the ship and not land in three feet of water. They had to, you mm-hmm. know, have these 20, 20 feet deep there. And I mean, it, it was this, this crazy uh, logistic, you know. And, and this, this this podcast would go on way too long. No, 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 please, no. How, we're fine. We're fine. How how people figured this out? I mean, uh, how things were scheduled. Uh, the, the 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 ship itself, mm-hmm. and and a lot of the sets were basically engineered the same way uh, <laughs> uh, cemeteries engineered letting a coffin into the, uh, the hole. You have cables under the, let's Church. say you have cables under the coffin, mm-hmm. and then the winches, you unwind the winches, and the, 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 the cable or straps loosen, and they, they start to take the weight of the coffin, and, it, and it, it drops into the hole. That is the same thing, that was the same thing as how that huge ship was, uh, uh, was dropped right. into 
And uh, also we had sets that had to be dry in, in her one scene, let's say, say take that giant dining room mm -hmm. with all those lights in there. Uh, we, we shot our dry scenes and then uh, a month or two later came back and shot the wet scenes. And we were in a, uh, the, that dry set was actually built inside a, a tank. So wow. now filled up with water and we have to change all of the lights out because uh, they're going to go underwater and they have to stay lit because that's what happened with the lights on the Titanic. So, so now you're into all, all kinds of logistical things. So, so to make it look like the water is rising, which one end of the, the set would be lowered on straps until uh, it, the water st started to creep in. And then the rest of the set would be lowered to make it look like the water was rising at a pretty fast rate. And then, then you end the take and you go back to one. But going back to one... Can I reset mean, everything? To reset everything. And there were, were times that the, the set would go into the water. And there, there's chaos happening. You've got hundreds of people. <laughs> and and all, that, all the silverware, all the tablecloths. Uh, they start to float around, and, and we're talking, you know, what, 100 tables or something like yeah. that. They're floating everywhere, so resetting is not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. And that, that was just kind of the story of each, all the amazing takes at the, end of the, at the end of the movie where the ship's going down and, and hundreds of people are running up and down the, uh, the, the, the ship. That, that was probably the last film when for real, when you saw 300 people running up and down, that right. was because four years later you'd have uh, one. Well, not even that long. You, along comes uh, Peter Jackson with uh, uh, Lord of the Rings, and he's got thousands of orcs or whatever running around, and they're all they're all computer driven, and, and so so Titanic was really that that movie that made the push out of out of uh, what we call the more classic kind of filmmaking. So how, and, but how did you shoot? Like, how do you shoot a film of that size? Like, just on a technical standpoint, the, the massive amount, how big was your camera department? It, it, that would depend on what we were shooting. We started off with the uh, smaller film, uh, uh, smaller scenes, uh, and, and we'd have one or two cameras, and that was it. And we, we'd go along that way for a while. And then when we got to uh, the really big stuff, uh, that's, well, for the cinematographer, for everybody, that's when the craziness happens is you've got, uh, Jim would say, hey, you know what, let's go outside tonight. I want to see the whole ship. And, uh, <laughs> and we're going, oh. Uh, we weren't even scheduled to do this for like three more days. And we're not even sure that we can get everything up and running because right. just going back to how, when you talk about the immensity, we wound up with something like, uh, uh, 40 miles of cable inside the ship and the ship, when you go around, when you look to the other side, all it is, is it's scaffolding, it, yeah. scaffolding. Right. and one side of it has what looks like a ship on it. And the, only the two top decks of the ship, are uh, built uh, along the real ship the, the, and the smokestacks and stuff like that. And so, uh, going back to my gaffer, when we're talking about the immensity of things, he says, uh, he comes back one day and he says, well, we're, we're going to start out with, we need, um, we need 1,500 lights. And Jesus. I, oh. And yeah, that's what I. That's exactly <laughs> Jesus, what kind of lights are we talking about? Like lights, lights, like film lights? Uh, he said, "Well, I counted. We counted the portholes, and we've got 750 portholes. Oh, Jesus! So we need uh, we need what we call a, a, a visible light that the camera can see that looks like it should belong there. And then we want a. Uh, every, we should have a, a at least a 1K." pointed out of every porthole. Okay. And so, so we've done, we've done the portholes and we're up to 1500 lights. So he starts to put his list together and he <laughs> list goes to, uh, uh, 20th century Fox and, 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 
John gets a little letter back, a little note that the, the, it's very, it's, it's a very nice note, but the subtext is you're insane. You don't know what you're doing. We're going to send down some people who are going to help you figure out how many lights you need. Okay. They do that. So they go up. So they go out with John. Uh, this is in pre-production. Yeah. One day. They come back at the end of the day. <laughs> and these guys say, you don't have enough lights. You need more lights. <laughs> and they were right. And I, and I have to hand it to 20th Century Fox. They found lights. They went to warehouses. They found, you know, and they, they, they refurbished a bunch of, uh, of lights. Because at the end of the day, you have just, you have those 1,500 lights just for the portholes. Mm -hmm. You have, uh, 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 and a lot of them have to be sealed uh, sure. because they go underwater. Right. Uh, and then you have uh, all the lights and all the sets for the whole movie. And I, now the, the number is slipping my mind, but we had uh, a phenomenal amount of, of lights, uh, not only decorative lights, but lights that we had to use, ranging from everything from the, the huge lights that, that kind of light the ship at night mm -hmm. to to everything we needed to make the movie because because you can't you ha you have to have your lights hidden and clustered because you can't just say oh I need a 5k and move it from the stern to the bow which is 800 feet away you know that's not going to work so uh, so it uh, to to John Buckley's credit I mean it was just an enormous undertaking to 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 do this and uh, I. But it, the, the number of lights was in the thousands. The cable, the cabling for this thing, which looked like, uh, I call it, it's like if you ever saw that movie Brazil by Terry Gilliam. Sure. It, it, it looked like a Terry Gilliam version of, of <laughs> the telephone company in the 50s. I mean, it was a complete uh, cluster, whatever, of, of cabling. And how it all stayed on, I'll never know. And, uh, and, and, uh, and it, it was, it, it was a constant battle, because uh, because lights, you know, they they you they're lights, go, <laughs> they're lights, and they go off, you know. <laughs> right. Just, God, it's fifteen hundred. My mind hurts. My brain is hurting thinking about trying to keep track of a shot because there was no high end visual. I guess they could have done something in visual effects, but but like you want fifteen hundred light, seven hundred something portals. You're in the middle of a shot. One of the lights goes out. Like, oh my god. Oh, yeah. And boy, and we learned our lesson the first night because we, uh, I mean, we had a lot of people back there, uh, be, uh, you know, in the scaffolding area. But because it was the first night and I think we were shooting a couple days earlier, mm -hmm. uh, we, like John would see some lights go out or, or worse, Jim would see some lights out. And he says, what are those lights doing out? And, you, and you'd look over and you hadn't noticed. I mean, oh, my God. Yeah. And so. John would say, get somebody down to so-and-so and so-and-so. And this is God on on its truth. So somebody would run back there. Mm -hmm. and, and and eventually you'd see the lights go on. And then about three minutes later, we'd hear, you know, this is so-and-so. I'm down here. I don't know where I am. I can't find my way out. You know, would somebody please come and get me because I, I'm, you know, I'm really starting to get nervous. You know, and I realize that uh, we would have to play a zone system from then on. And the same person, we, we put everything in quadrants. So, like, going up, you had level, you, you'd have level, uh, you know, A, B, C, D, you know, all the way to whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then, and then horizontally, you'd have a number. So... Every every quadrant, and we'd have the same person, as boring as this is, work the same, fairly small quadrant night after night, because that is uh, 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 that was the only way we we could do this efficiently. But it, it, that that looking back now, it seems funny. But when you're waiting, when the director is waiting, <laughs> it wasn't so funny. I mean, it's but, it's it's honestly, it's a miracle that no one got hurt. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think in construction, like somebody... Stunt? Oh, really? Yeah, and we did have, uh, let's see, some somebody else got hit by a car walking along the road down there. That, that wasn't on the set. Right. And, 
and then that we had one big night uh, uh, that had been rehearsed for weeks where the the at the end of the at the end of the movie the the the, the stern of the ship goes near near vertical mm -hmm. yes people start falling down mm -hmm. and this was and they were what they were falling down into was a a, a bunch of stunt pads covered in green so we could extend the, the sure. ship to make it look longer and they, they had it all worked out so the timing so one person would fall and and they were when i say fall they were all on these things uh these descender rig, descender fan mm -hmm. rigs that would slow the fall down. It would still look real, but it would, you know, they they weren't literally falling or under control. But they they had to get out of the harness and and then jump out of the pad, you know, uh, not get out of the harness, but disconnect and right. jump. But uh, on the first two takes, uh, in the in the excitement of it all, uh, like. Some people weren't getting out of the way, so the next person down, like somebody cracked a rib, and right. somebody landed. And, and and Jim just said, "Hey, we're not doing this anymore. So more people, somebody's going to really get hurt." And uh, uh, so we came back later, and we, the the really significant falls they they were done by uh, CG. CG, yeah. yeah, CG based based on a real person doing a fall. It that then became a CG person. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It, he was cutting edge because there was nothing like that at that point. There was yeah. nothing like that at that point. Yeah, and if you look back at it now, you know, you could, yeah, you can pick certain things apart and go, well, that person's not quite rocking right. That must have been. Yeah, my favorite, but, my favorite spoof or the, the the biggest mistake I've saw in Titanic, if I could be so bold as to call something out, was when Jack's running down the hall while the water's rushing behind him, him and yeah. Rose. And you see the face that they pl they face replaced the stunt people. Yeah. And you could, it, that's the, uh, the only really like blaring visual effect shot. That was like, ah, oh. yeah, I, that, that, that was the one where, you know, he really tried to make that work. And I, I guess, you know, I, he pushed the technology too far. <laughs> yeah. And, and now, now face replacement is, is, is common. Place, but with, uh, at that time. Now there's uh, one. Now there's one more question about Titanic I had, and this is a I read an American cinematographer magazine article years ago that I think you gave about the wide shot of the ship sinking uh, into the water. Th that the bulbs, because they were hot, the bulbs on the actual deck, not like pr film movie movie lights, but actual lights, practicals would hit the, the water and they would pop. So then after you would reset, you would have someone go in there and have to re-unscrew and screw back in new lights. Is that true? Or is that something, yeah. some truth? Here's the, the, the timing on all of those scenes where that, that started out basically looking dry and then sinking into the water, timing was of the essence because uh, let's just take the dining room. Mm -hmm. uh, dining room... Uh, when we shot all the dry, the, the, the dry for dry scenes like dinners and stuff like that, basically normal lights. Mm -hmm. But when that same set was going to sink into the water, all the bulbs had to be uh, enclosed in a glass fitting. They, they had to be watertight because as soon as water hit any of these bulbs, uh, uh, they would explode. Yeah. Oh God. Also, if they just stayed on, eventually the heat would build up inside that airtight uh, container, and it would explode because of the heat. Jesus. So what we had to do was, I mean, and, and again, because we had so many people in these scenes. We would work and work and work and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse, get our whole camera set up. Then you would do, and this is this was just common thing, especially with with syncing things. You'd have to do a set search with uh, divers going <laughs> down to the set to oh make sure God. there was nothing, or and there was nobody down there who had been left behind. Somebody who hadn't heard the we're going to shoot. You got to. So that would be time consuming too. So also, so you're looking at another 20 minutes just to do that 
then the real action, once you call action, the real action has to happen uh, within was it a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. or something? Because as soon as you roll cameras, when well, the lights come on, you roll cameras, and then you know that about a minute and a half from now, these lights have to be underwater or they're going to explode. So that's the, that's the timing issue uh, of it all. Is there was this kind of this uh, one and a half or two minute drill mm -hmm. that thing had to happen so that the lights would go underwater. But inevitably, uh, if you say let's just say let's just say a hundred lights, okay, you go for take two. Seven of those lights have gone out. So we had a team that would run in, grab those lights, and then replace them with lights that were, were, were working. That part didn't take us, because we were prepared for that, mm -hmm. that didn't take as long as it, you know, it might have. Wow. Now, what, uh, and I, I know you've given me so much of your time today, Russell. Thank you so much. I have a few more questions if you're, if you're game. Sure. All right. Um, what is the biggest lesson you learned from shooting Titanic? Because that it, it, there's, it was unlike an experience that most cinematographers will ever have. Yes, in fact, my, my crew who uh, worked with me for a long time said, you know, gee, Russ, when are we ever going to do this big movie? And uh, <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. Af after uh, At the end of the day, the last, the last day, they called rap, and instead of a big whoopee, yay, we did it, yeah. people like zombies just wandered to the parking lot, got into their cars, and drove away. <laughs> bro <laughs> bro broken, broken souls. Broken spirits, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, gosh, the biggest lesson was uh, on, a, on a film like that, that big, you, you can't be overwhelmed by trying to gobble up the whole experience all at once if then you'd never start you just right. uh, for for me it was okay i've got the scene i'm going to do the best i can on this scene this day and i i know i've got a group of really good people who are working on the the sets that we're going to shoot you know a week from now or two weeks from now just to really just hang in there and uh and do do your very best that you can with, with what's in front of you, and that, that was the only way I got through it. Yeah, because you, if you try to, yeah, right. If you try to eat the entire cake, you'll never get through. You have to take it bite by bite, slice yeah. by slice, day by day. Yeah. Now, what's the biggest mistake you see young cinematographers make? Uh, well, because. <laughs> Because I've seen a lot of really great young cinematographers, and I, I don't know what's, what, what else is happening out there. I think, gosh, the, the only thing I think is that there, was, there was a value in shooting film in that you really had to know your stuff, what, what you can do with exposure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing that I'm hearing from the lab is that... Uh, that, that sometimes people shoot thinking that they can fix everything in when they when they get into the you know the, the post production process mm -hmm. and, and they you know and I can't say that I've seen because I've never seen that but the labs have and they they say don't these people know that their film could look so much better if they really paid attention to the lighting of this actress or this actor that, and, 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 and try to do as much of the work on the day while, while you're shooting. And then also know, also because you have a very good, then if you have a very good sense of what can be done and should be done in post, you can say, you know what, that wall over there is too bright right now, but I know it's going to take me 15 minutes to to fix that now, and I can do it in, in 30 seconds in post. You mm -hmm. Just in that kind of knowledge of, of, uh, uh, would be a big, big help, I think. All right. That's very, that's very, very good advice. Now, yeah. 
what would you, on a business standpoint, uh, a film business standpoint, what advice would you give a cinematographer wanting to break into the business? Uh, well, be, besides the thick skin and, and knowing, hey, you've got to be in this for the long run. Mm -hmm. Those are the first two things. I, uh, God, there's so many things. Just learning to work with people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's such a, because lots of people are really good at what they, they, they do and, and they're not good uh, at the, the people end of it. I, I, would, I would say the, the cinematographer, even though you just want to be an artist, the cinematographer has to be an artist, of course, but a scientist, enough, enough to know what the camera that he or she's working with can do, what it's capable of. You also have to be a, a manager because as you go along, you, you're going to have to start to, to manage how how that your your what your your people your weapons are how they're positioned mm -hmm. you know in terms of who's who's doing what so you're getting the most efficient use uh, of them and then uh, and then a, a politician a politician <laughs> and, and I mean not not so yeah. much in the smarmy sense of that we often think mm -hmm. of, but it is a political business when when I shoot a a, a test with an actor or an actress. Part of what I'm doing there, I mean, uh, at the screen test is not only not only learning what I need to know, but really imparting to that actor or actress that I will have their best interest at heart. I want to make politically, I, I want them to be comfortable to know that uh, uh, the set for them is going to be a safe place where they can do their best work. So there's that politics. Uh, political in the sense that somebody did a bonehead thing mm -hmm. uh, who did a bonehead thing and instead of yelling at them no people make mistakes uh, this person was trying to do their best job mm -hmm. my own grief with, with people is if, if <laughs> the, the biggest issue I have is that I know somebody's very competent and they're just not trying mm -hmm. that that's a big issue for me but that, so, so anyway, there, there are so many things you've got to be able to do and make, make art while, while catastrophe is happening around you. And that's the other thing. Those, those are, so in a nutshell, those are the things <laughs> that I, I pay attention to as I was doing it. Now, I'll, I'm going to ask you the last few questions that I ask all my guests. Um, okay. Can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Holy. <laughs> these are these are heavy questions. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if I have an answer for you right now. What book? Yeah. Uh, I didn't know. I don't have an answer for. That. All right. Well, then we'll move on to the next question. It's okay. Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in life or in the film business? Uh. In life and the film business, because it seems like wh whatever whatever we choose to do in life, there are other lessons that, that we're here. It seems to me we have to learn. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when is, say, as passionate as I am or as fast as I want to go or whatever, or as good as I want the uh, picture to look, uh, I have to have empathy for what anybody on the set is, is going through. I mean, I think developing empathy that, that, that somebody might be at work and they might be coming off a very, very tumultuous home life mm -hmm. or, or uh, they're working uh, and, uh, uh, you know, maybe they're, they're, they're working with, a, with some injury that's healing or, mm -hmm. uh, or just that I could say something I don't think it happens much now, but I, I could certainly see it happening early on. You, you say something that's meant to be a joke, and yet it cuts to the quick with somebody. And, and you just have to have, just trying to, again, have the empathy of what it's like to be another person on the set, work to be, you know, having, having to, to work with me. What, what is that experience like? So. The excellent, excellent answer. And uh, what are three of your favorite films of all time? 
Oh my God. Uh, and, and pick anything that comes to mind. <laughs> okay. Just for the look of it, red. Uh, searching for Bobby Fisher because oh, I love the story. I love the way it was shot. Uh, oh God, there's so many. Uh, <laughs> the three. Searching, uh, searching for Bobby Fisher is such a uh, that is like a DP's movie, isn't it? The what he did, uh, and the name. I'm sorry, please forgive me. The oh, name. Oh, Conrad Hall. Oh uh, yes, Conrad Hall. What he yeah. did with like he was shooting with mirrors and. He was what he did in that movie for cinema on a cinematography standpoint is remarkable, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and just just the guts it, it, it took to do some of the things that he did, and, and, but how beautiful that film looked, and not, and how it was shot, and the camera was placed because you, uh, a, a lot of the time in that film you really are putting yourself in the place of this very young, young, I guess, like eleven years old chess, mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and and that was great. Oh God! There's there's so many more films and oh you know Red Shoes, which a lot of people oh, of might. course yes yeah. Red Shoes is just I, I, I to me I, I I thought that was a stunning a stunning film and a, and a marvel of the the technicolor process and I I probably got a hundred I mean, hundred more probably <laughs> yeah but those, right now right here that that's what comes to mind yeah. and last question what was it like winning the Oscar. <laughs> I, I have been asked that, and I think it's a. Uh, for for me, it was really weird. I, I, when I found out, it's all about the dress, you know, uh, my, <laughs> my, my, my wife's dress, what she was going to wear. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, it, it was at that point, I was not. Uh, I, I think I was so serious, I, I didn't really allow myself to feel. The, the joy, the kind of kick in the pants that that must be, mm-hmm. I, uh, uh, the and what happened was I won the the Oscar, mm-hmm. and then within uh, 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 eight hours later I was in the hospital. I, I uh, oh the very God. same night I passed a kidney. St- no, I didn't pass, but I had a kidney stone, and I sure. was in such, such agony. <laughs> Uh, so you really couldn't you couldn't relish in the achievement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was like, uh, yeah. But uh, it, it's really weird. Like right now, I feel like I'm enjoying my, uh, uh, what passes for a career as uh, a much, much more. I, I, I'm having much, much more fun on the set, appreciating mm-hmm. people a lot more, and mm-hmm. and and I have uh, I, I I would say a little bit, uh, or maybe maybe a considerable amount. Uh, more of tranquility because uh, early on I was just so nervous about you know how things were going or not going mm-hmm. and now I, I I look back and I say yeah well like right now I'm going through a period where nobody seems to be calling mm-hmm. and and now I'm going through a period where too many people have called and I <laughs> or whatever you right, know right just I just say uh, I I can take what's Kind of on the plate uh, with a, a more ease than I than I did before. Russell, I want to thank you so so much for your time and and amazing stories and amazing advice you're giving our listeners. Thank you again so much for for being here. Okay, well, thank you very much. That interview does not disappoint. Russell again is so amazing, and thank you, Russell, so much for taking the time out. I know. You literally just got back from Bali and heading over to Vancouver, and you had two days to rest, and you took an hour and a half of that time to speak to me. So thank you again. And I hope you guys got a lot out of that interview. Uh, you know, I, It was just such a thrill for me to sit down and talk to Russell and to pick his brain about his process and his firsthand experience of working on some of the biggest movies of all time, working with the biggest directors and filmmakers of, of our generation. So it, it, it was such a pleasure and humbling experience uh, doing this. So I hope you guys got a lot out of it. I know I did. I got really jacked up and really exp- inspired and, and I kind of start shooting again, but there'll be more on that later. Uh, but anyway, guys, thanks again for listening. If you want to see anything we talked about in the show, head over to our show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 179. This is a long one, so I'll keep it short. Keep that hustle going. Keep the dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 